what can we all as politicians do to try and prevent young people from becoming homeless in the first place, then it is about looking at solutions that are more complicated, more difficult to deliver and will take longer to actually produce the results. I first began my journey through the system when I was about 13 years old. Admittedly, my behaviour at home was not great and my mum and I were locked in a cycle of bad behaviour, rules, punishment and rebellion. I don't feel I had a close relationship with my mum. It seemed the more I misbehaved, the more I was punished emotionally. This resulted in me further rebelling to the point where our relationship broke down. Although I think my mum had contacted social services because I suppose she felt she couldn't cope, I wasn't placed in foster care but with my auntie and uncle. This was okay to begin with, but even though they were family, they had their own issues. Also, the pressures within the family were tense at times. I felt I was just one more problem, and at times I'm sure I was a channel for some of their frustrations. This was a low point for me. I was very down. When you can't get away from your problems, sometimes you try to hide from them. I soon discovered a way to hide, and I found refuge from the feeling of abandonment and worthlessness. I began dabbling in drinking and smoking hash. It was an escape. It dulled down the emotions out that I was going through. The end result was I began missing school, which led to further isolation. I used to sleep a lot and dream of a life that wasn't like the one I was trapped in. Then I would wake up and realise that I wasn't wanted. I felt so alone. My auntie fell pregnant and there was no room, at least not for me. So social services were phoned and again I was moved on. Although at this point I knew I was going to be going to strangers, I remember thinking it would be good to get away. Maybe the family would be okay and I would get looked after. By this point, I needed clothes, shoes and some kind of support, any kind of support. Moving in with my foster parents was okay and the house was nice. Before long, things went downhill. The food made for me was cheap and nasty and I had the feeling that any money she got from me was not being spent on what it should have been. I had nothing and this was reflected in my view of myself. I felt like I was at the bottom of the pile, looked down on at school. When you're a teenager, you're judged on by your clothes, your trainers and because I had no money to buy big brands, I was singled out and made fun of. I couldn't take it anymore, so I stopped going to school and I found a familiar solace in drinking and smoking hash to try to block the reality of the situation. Things came to a head when my foster parent caught me in my room smoking a fag. Usually she didn't bother that much, but that day she was very angry. She grabbed me and I could feel nails tearing into my skin, so I pushed her to get her off me. I ran to my room and turned my stereo on full blast, knowing full well that the social services would be called. When people are referred as homeless, um, they have a, an 0800 call centre number that they contact. The homeless assessment team um, take all the personal details um, from each individual. Right, okay. Um, I'm just going to do a short risk assessment now. Some of the questions are quite personal, but they're mainly for a risk assessment just to get a better idea of your situation, and everyone mm -hmm. does get asked them, okay? Okay. Have you had any stays in hospital in the last... Well, my history of self-harm or any attempted suicide at all. Do you have any unspent offences on your record? Anything you've ever been convicted of in the past? Uh, have you got a, a doctor at the moment? I had to go through this whole assessment thing. And, like, it was total personal, personal questions. And quite a few of them I didn't want to answer. But I felt I had to. Like, I didn't want to answer the questions. I really didn't want to tell them. I just thought, well, who are you? I don't even know who you are. You're on the other end of the phone. I've no idea what you look like, I've got no idea about anything. I just know that you're this person that wants to know stuff about my life. From these details, the homeless officer is then able to um, identify whether or not the person has a priority need for homelessness. Priority need would mean that it was a pregnant lady, um, anyone at all that had a family living with them, um, anyone who was a care leaver, 16, 17 year olds, anyone leaving the armed forces, the prison, um, anyone with a, a mental, physical, um, any sort of disability, and the council would therefore have a duty to assist these people into some form of housing. Just the other now, being told that I'm a non-priority um, because I'm not vulnerable. How am I not vulnerable? Because I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic, I don't take drugs. Well, I don't have a drug issue. It's just like, eh, I'm homeless, I've got nowhere to stay, that's vulnerable enough, is it not? It shouldn't really matter what your situation is. Um, every situation should be treated differently because you don't really know why 
that person's become homeless. Um, they've got like set categories that you've got to come under and I've had to fight all my way through to get my priority status. The popular view is that they maybe shouldn't be given higher priority because some of the things I've in their view, self-inflicted, like drugs and alcohol and so on. But there are people who have suffered from domestic abuse and so on that should be equally, if not higher, priority. Well, in 2003, the Labour Liberal Democrat Executive brought forward legislation um, which would um, take away the um, priority need category that's always been there before. Um, it was groundbreaking uh, homelessness legislation and, you know, the SNP um, certainly supported it, as I did. Um, the problem was that they hadn't put in any money to support it. Back out the door to the caravan before anybody like to the house notices me or anything like that. Eh? And it's no nice being on the streets and that, like, you know what I mean, especially in the winter time. Eh? But if it wasn't for this place and like places like this, uh, people could come and get like blankets when it's cold outside and that, and come in and get a three course meal for £1.50. And, Things can't be that bad, you know what I mean? Because if it was it for this place, there would be a lot of people who can... I reckon would probably, the crime rate would probably be back up in Leiden, you know what I mean? But people can just... Be, can no bother about the boss or anything, just run in a shop, just grab me anything that's worth money and just run in back out the door with it. Can. It's called kamikaze in it, yeah? <laughs> people that will come to home for good leaving. They're either homeless or, you know, in fear of being homeless, so they're looking for either advice or assistance straight away, yeah. Um, so we do provide homeless officers up the stairs along the housing advice workers up the stairs. So you could have people that, if their marriage is broken down and they need to split the family home, so they'll come and get advice through the homeless assessment team or through housing advice through how to sell their property. And obviously if they're going to become homeless then they get picked up by the, the homeless assessment team, which is Fife Council. You often find that when people are coming in the door, they're at the height of their crisis point. So they need, to, they need some help to at least feel that at least I can go somewhere else and it gets them at a steady plateau for basically moving them on. Now. What we do for Frontline Fife is we have a programme running called Cornerstone Connections and this is the employability programme that we work with Laura for Gilvin. So through that, we, we identify people who have got mental health and drug problems or drug issues. So that it's a dual diagnosis. And it doesn't have to be evenly balanced. It could be, you know, as long as they do have... They've got both, and usually they come hand in hand. So with that, what we try and do then is they'll sit down with the, one of the two girls that work here downstairs and they'll go through an Edinburgh employability assessment and they'll get scored as well um, on a Richter scale uh, to see how their mental health and how their well-being, how they feel about themselves. And then the girls will open a case for them to work with them at building skills and do a care plan of sort to then see what, what steps they need to take with the main aim of trying to get them back to some form of employability. As an employability worker, I would say my, my job is to signpost them into 
employment and signpost them into education uh, along the lines of that. But then working in th this sector, I think uh, the, employ the, the most important part to me is being there, being providing opportunities, providing activities that break the norm for them, take them out of what their everyday system is uh, and doing that in a fun manner. <laughs> When you take a look at their faces, I mean, they are enjoying themselves, you know what I mean? Uh, they would normally be sitting about in a building, kicking their heels, playing their Xboxes, you know what I mean? They're outside, fresh air, you know what I mean? Uh, just total exercise, just everything about it is a positive step for them. Right, so what I need is three volunteers. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks <laughs> It's a bit of respite away from in my accommodation and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, good to get out, get fit, and meet new people. Have a laugh. I think when we look at last night and they, when they first came, that they, they had sort of a wee bit of fears of how what was going to happen to them. But I think the army's done really well in the sense that uh, everything they've offered them, uh, they've gradually taken to them. Benefits agency are not very helpful. Um, I don't think they have any empathy towards the situation that people that are homeless are in. You do have families with children. You have single people to teach too. Um, and yes, they don't have any food. But because the service is so impersonal within the benefits agency, um, and it's also very, very cloistered, one person will only know about one thing, they won't know the full benefit system and they're very reticent to give out information. Um, no one takes any responsibility, so ultimately it's nobody's responsibility if they're not getting any food. My benefits never got sorted until about a month after I moved in because it was coming up for the Christmas period and everything like that, so I had no money, so I had to drop out of college as well at that time. And I lost my place for my level two hairdresser and, and I lost all my qualifications that I'd got so far because I hadn't finished the course because obviously my benefits hadn't been sorted out and I didn't have the money to get through there. And that was really hard, so I had to get like food parcels and things like that because obviously I had no food, I had nothing. I had nothing at all. To be honest, I felt sort of embarrassed that somebody else had to give me food because I didn't have the money or anything like to eat. I think it's sad in a society like we live in that people, it's down to food parcels. Uh, I also think that it's totally inappropriate for people to go down the road of crisis loans or to have to go down the road of crisis loans because often these crisis loans um, are relatively difficult to access. There is crisis loans that can be um, given, um, but then they say it's got to be paid back. Now, I mean, I don't see any reason why, if somebody's assessed, they need, they need to wait until the benefit comes through. I would have thought that a crisis loan should then form part of the benefit. Uh, and, you know, as I say, I mean, I think the Westminster government needs to do more at looking um, at how the benefit system operates and how it operates for young people and the disadvantages it places young people in. And the space between when you should have had your benefit and when you do get your benefit, you're left often with no food, no way of getting heating or getting washing facilities because your gas or electrics ran out and you've no food in the cupboard so you've just you basically had to go back to what you were doing when you were homeless and like eating food past its sell by day and raking shop bins and stuff like that. Do you have a recent history of violence? Have you been in any fights for that in the last year? And do you have any pets at all at the moment? Due to the cost of homeless accommodation, um, people cannot cannot access employment, they cannot access going into education without incurring huge debts. Um, the rents within the, the accommodation, because it is supported, can vary from £99 a week to £150 to £160 a week. So even going in at an NC level, um, it's just not affordable because of the debts that would occur. Uh, so they're in a trap. 
and when they go into homeless accommodation, they'll get the support and they get to a certain level where they're ready to move on with their lives. But because they can't afford to, um, because of the cost of the rents, they're stuck. They have a fund, a student's fund, that they can access. If they're students and they're getting into problems, then they can access a fund for assistance with rent and things. And I contacted um, Adam Smith, and they had said that they have that fund and they would cover the rent portion, but not the support. But the largest part of the rent is the support. So you maybe you might be fifty pound a week for the rent, but the support element could be a hundred. And that the colleges said that they cannot cover that cost through the funds. There's no point in can going to get yourself a job eh, because the amount of money can you're better off like no working at all because the amount of money you hate paying support even though you're not wanting it eh, is just too much. Eh? So it's basically when you're coming in here, you're basically getting encouraged not to work, eh? And if you get a scatter flat, it's the same thing as well, eh? So it's no it's no worth your while even when you get a scatter flat to start working, eh? Because you hate to pay hundreds of pounds, eh? Honestly, they'll take probably about 60, 70 percent of your wages, eh? And you just don't see the point at the end of the day, eh? I've got an interview coming up for a job um, at MGT, so I'm ho hoping to get that, but at the same time, I don't really want to get a job until I've moved on to my own tenancy because of the amount of money that they take off me. And it's like, I'm not any better off. And it's like, there's no motivation for me to want to go out there and get a job because I'm like, right, they're taking all my money, so what's the point? When I can sit here all day and get money at the end of the week and get all my rent paid for me. Do you know what I mean? Why would I have to do anything? But at the same time, I want to get myself back out there and back out in the world and actually do something instead of sitting there all week and getting paid for it because I'm not earning the money I get. I'm not doing anything for it. I'm just sitting there and eating junk food and watching crap on TV. You don't earn a great deal on the big issue, but it, it's certainly enough to get yourself a meal during the day. I've seen it as a, a step forward, um, and it was one way to sort of keep my head above water. At least once or twice a week, you have, you have someone shouting at you, get a real job, or piss off, or and swearing at you, and being abusive, but for, for every two people that shout that, there's 150 people who are nice to you or, or well-mannered towards you. But I, I generally find with the big issue, ignorance is, is more of a problem than anything. People don't understand like why you're doing it. They, they think you're, because you're selling a big issue, you're automatically a drug addict, and when that's quite often not the case. Eh? I think employers discriminate. When you look at uh, young people from here, that apply, we often tell them when they're applying for a job that they put down the address and that the project. If they, an employer picks up an application form and it has the project name and then the address, I believe that that will end up in a pile. Whereas if it's just the address, then they might at least get to the interview stage. And I think that indicates, I know from personal experience and I know from past experience of working in this field, that it's true. Employers look at people from homelessness, you know, I mean, if they're homeless, then how are they going to manage to get to work? If they're homeless, you know, I mean, can they, do have they have good timekeeping? Do they smell? You know, I mean, do they do this here? Is their personal hygiene going to be suitable? I think, sadly, uh, there's a stereotype that um, for many of them it's their own fault. And I personally don't think that's uh, the case. There may be instances where that has occurred. But young people um, need support in life. Everybody needs support at some time in their life, uh, including politicians need support at times in their life. Um, but I think it's important that um, when young people face challenges, they are given real support and it's not a token gesture. It's not true to say that the homeless are druggies, alcoholics, uh, or people who have gone down a road of crime and have been disowned by their families. There are other reasons why uh, that's occurred and often it's of no fault of the individual concerned, but they feel almost like lepers that uh, because they're homeless, they're dependent upon friends and other families to support them. There's still this, um, this stigmatised photograph of the, the guy sleeping in the doorway at the train station, and it does happen, but that's really the minority um, and the the ones who are in that situation tend to be like more of the revolving door, but they are a small percentage. I mean, there's there's 
three and a half thousand people go to Fife Council every year to see we're homeless, albeit family, be it single people. Um, and that's a lot of people, but the minority are the ones that are rough sleeping. But I think the public at large tend to view homelessness as someone who just has given up life and just a waste of space. It's often hard to understand why someone is actually homeless when the government, you know, appears to have all the facilities to provide these people with homes. I mean, but do they really need to be homeless? I mean, well, is, is, there nowhere, is there nowhere at all for them to get a house? Well, I don't actually think there should be any homelessness in Scotland, to, to be honest. There's enough houses going about. Um, most of them become homeless because probably get into trouble, get chucked out for their houses. Uh, drugs, drink, debt, marriage, divorce, that kind of thing. And what surgery are they at? Do you have to register with the police under the Sex Offenders Act? Uh, do you have any medical problems at all? My next home was the worst yet. It was dirty and untidy to the point I felt unclean. My carer showed favouritism to her own children over the foster kids so blatantly that I knew full well that she was only doing it for the money and care was not on her agenda. I can remember arguments where my mum had been paying her money, child benefit I think, and she denied it. My mum had to pay it back even though she had given it to my carer. One day I came back to find her boyfriend smoking smack. I told my social worker I wanted out, but as she wanted me to explain to my carer the reasons why, I froze and said nothing. I remember she would spend a lot of time in the bathroom, and one day I found lots of tinfoil hidden in the cupboard. Assuming that she too was on smack, I didn't know what to do. I stayed because at this stage I had started seeing a boy and was staying at his a lot. I came back to my carer's house one day. One of her friends started an argument with me and it became violent. My carer worked me out. The social worker was my only hope. They said there were no other carers available to take me. I asked if I could stay with my boyfriend until one came up. The social worker said that would be fine but I would have to sign a disclaimer, which I did. I did not find out until later that I had signed myself out of care. She hadn't made me aware that this was the case. Again, I had been dumped. I had no option now but to stay with my boyfriend, even though I hadn't known him for that long. But I had no choice. I became homeless due to eviction. My boyfriend, as far as I knew, was meant to be paying bills and rent. I was giving him half the money to pay towards these, but he didn't pay any of them. He was hiding letters from the council and reminders from the gas and electric companies. Then I found out he was cheating. I put him out and changed the locks. What was already a difficult situation turned worse when I found letters he had been hiding and realised that nothing had been getting paid. As more came through the post, I became aware that the situation was far beyond repair. As a long period of time had passed, I knew that by this time there would be no way I could pay the amount of money that they wanted straight away, and in reality, I would severely struggle to pay it off anyway. Although I got some help from Trade and Standards, it was still too late to repair the damage, so it came that I was evicted. Someone who's from St Andrews doesn't want a permanent tenancy in Dunfermline. It's not a place they want to be. They don't have the social contacts there or the networks. There's not, no one that comes up to visit me at all. I mean, my grand, she, she doesn't drive her in any. She's not well at all, so I only get to see her once a week and twice at the weekend. And I've, no, I've not seen my mum in about three weeks. But I mean, she'll phone me, but it's no, not the same. So... Aye, but it's all right. Can I'll get over it. Only thing you can do, eh? My dad and that, they're just, they have their own wee world and it's hard to go and see them and things like that because obviously I have no money to get down. But I do try and see them at least once every two weeks or something, but it's not the same as seeing them every day. So, but my mum, I don't, really see her. I've not seen her for three months, so... But I've not even seen my daughter for about eight months, nine months. She's only a year and a half, so she'll not even know who I am. I've lost quite a lot of friends for it, and, like, some friends just didn't want to know you because you were in a homeless place, and other people just didn't keep in contact because you were too far away to keep in contact with them. Because I'm from Dunfermline, and it is a far away to travel, like, every day to go and see my friends, like what I used to do. But I gained new friends and life's all about experience. I've been moving, moving from place to place, kind of, to be closer to my son and that, yeah, kind of things like that. So sometimes it's just been moving to places that's made me homeless, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't, I mean, 
a lot, a lot, a lot of people that are homeless are getting on. Got a lot of problems like me myself, eh? But uh, the main part, there's just there's just not enough. Who's out there for folk? And eh, around about here anyway, in Fife and that, eh? Again, it's just not enough. Especially up in there, the homeless is getting worse around about here now. And a lot of folk become estranged for the families, then they become homeless. And there's people who become homeless and then become estranged for their families. Um, I think there should needs to be accommodation spread throughout Fife, and I'm not sure you know that it's exactly right in terms of um, the number of people who are making applications. And I think that's something that the council needs to look at, and I'm quite sure that they will do. Um, but I do think that you know family and friends are very very important, and that's why, as far as possible, I have always believed that people need to be housed round about where their relatives are because they provide a network of help and support. If she's at a loose end, sometimes she's waiting on me coming in going, no, what we're meeting the day. <laughs> okay, so she really quite enjoys it and I enjoy spending oh, time yeah. while Louise while she's doing it because she really fully engages and you can tell she's enjoying what she's doing. She's not just doing it for the free meal aspect. Okay, she's actually getting something out of it. Although getting it for getting oh, something yeah. to eat for nothing is a, That's Ken, a bonus, but it's I definitely like, a bonus. I like cooking eh? I've done it in fifth year, eh? Hospitality. Brown after it got an A. So me like it's just a one spot. Me that um be able to cook like stuff like this, which is like where I can feed myself. I can make this when I go to my flat or wherever in the assistance. It's good because I like it, I'm making it made like stuff, but it's not like dinner type meals, so here I can say oh, I want to make a castle of what I'm doing, I can I want to make this, I want to make that. And I get shown how to make it, and then I know how to make it. So it's not really about the free meal and I enjoy it. So. But and to be fair, I mean, you've done the lion's share of that yourself, mm -hmm. following a recipe. I'm just basically here uh, to give her that wee bit of confidence sure that she kens what she's doing if she's no sure, eh? I do come in and do cookery with, with the girls, which um, is a good way of me having a conversation. People, when they're busy doing things, I'll often blether away to you without even realising. The guard kind of come down because it's a kind of it's an activity that they're doing and you're doing it with them. So you become more like a friend to them then. And and that's kind of scenario. So um I think cookery is a really good way of having a laugh, having a joke, showing them how to make a meal. Um, that ask questions about the meal and then you can go on to having a blather about can, and it's a good way of opening a conversation about what kind of things would you have at home if you were at home and then it's a good way of just getting them to open up and discuss general issues in their life, eh? So the support they give you in hostels is really good. You just have to ask for, uh, obviously, for help. And that's what I've done. They sit and have a talk with me and, uh, and it does help when I sit and talk to them about my problems and they give me like they will offer me like counselling and that. I have had counselling uh, and that and it did help, it really did. Because I was able to talk about the stuff that I've never spoke to anyone about. Without the help of the staff I probably I probably wouldn't have been able to do what I do now and like live on my own. I probably wouldn't have been able to do that at all. It's great having someone that you know for a fact that even if you don't want someone to come up, you still know that if there's that time that you want someone to come up, you know that they're going to be there and you know that you can just text them and be like, right, okay, can we change our meeting to today because I, I need to talk to someone or something like that. So it makes it a lot easier to live in there because you're on your own. You know that that support is still there for you. A lot of these girls didn't have anybody to trust in their life. You know, so to have one person to trust for a, for, for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, a couple of days, for as long as they're here, 
could be it could make a massive impact in their life and learn and and then they can learn for that and maybe go on to trust other people in other projects and do you know what I mean just kind of build that build that kind of trust element back up in their lives see eh? failure to some of these youngsters is such a big big word um, if they think they've failed they think that is just the end of their world um, I think sometimes it's trying to make them understand that don't set your goals too high don't set your targets too high we would never expect too much for these youngsters because the minute they don't reach what your expectation is then that they take that as a personal failure and that can have such a, a, a an effect on the next part of how they, they deal with that. So we always set targets and goals and things small. I mean, I always say, how do you eat an elephant in very small chunks? So that's what we always say to them. Um, break things down. Break them down into small pieces and deal with small pieces at a time. Rather than say that, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm comfortable, I can do this, this and this. And the minute it doesn't happen, then, as I say, they take it as a personal failure and it just puts them back down the slippery slope again. When you see people, maybe, who have got loads of potential and out of your control, like, it's out of your control, they're not fulfilling it and it's not because they don't want to, you know, and a lot of the time, particularly if you're working with people with uh, mental health difficulties or, or drug and alcohol, which is something that they don't have control over and sometimes it doesn't make sense, you know, some people just seem to be doing really well and then you see them just crashing out and I think that's that's really difficult, you know. Or if they've maybe left the project and you saw them move on when they were on a high. Sometimes girls have left under dodgy circumstances and things like that. Somebody that a service user that I've actually probably spent a lot of time with and I'm a bit, oh, she's left, I've never seen her leave and the circumstances in which she left probably weren't probably weren't the best and things like that and then I've never seen that girl again okay, so, so people will come into your mind and you'll, you'll think oh I wonder how they're getting on and, and things like that but it's the nature of the beast eh? the, people come in come and go so frequently that you spend so can you might spend five minutes thinking about somebody but before you know it, you're presented with somebody new so you've just got to keep going okay, and just just keep going but to me that that's um, part of my job that is part of the job description if I can't deal with that then I'm in the wrong job okay and it's not about me it's about them eh? do you have any issues relating to the abuse of drugs or alcohol have you ever been in prison have you ever been in the armed services <laughs> in this situation, young people don't ask to be abused, young people don't ask to become homeless, young people don't ask for any of this. It's just life and the, and the cards that you get thrown in life, you just have to get on with it and deal with it. As an adult that's easy to say, but as a young person, a uh, 16 year old coming into a, a situation like this, from a feeling vulnerable, feeling uh, isolated from family, parents, whatever, do you know what I mean? Uh, it's a hard one, very hard. Obviously was working within this homeless sector, uh, we do have young people who come along with various di different background issues. So sometimes you have to look at the issues to look at the person. And once you've resolved some of the issues, then you can look at taking the person further forward. The issues that they might have might not be suitable to be able to work on. You know, if you're looking at confidence and self-esteem, you might need to look at the background issues before you look at the confidence and self-esteem. Eventually, when I was seven, my dad got custody of me. And I went and stayed with him. And everything was fine up until... 
started high school and then he met someone else and she came in and it was like over the, the three years that they were together he was really like me and my dad used to be really close and one day he just turned around and he was like oh I don't really need to tell you anything anymore I've got my wife to talk to and I was just like all right okay it was a bit you know a bit of slap in the face eh? and I was just like okay <laughs> I'll take that and then my dad had this little blue book thing and like obviously you really shouldn't be nosy but I had to be so I was like looking through it and um, it said that my dad had gone to see us today and I told him that my mum told me that she didn't want me anymore and that she wished she'd never had me. And obviously she was young at that time because she only had me when she was 16. So it's, under it's sort of understandable but at the same time it really hurt as well because I, I was old enough to understand that then. My dad started drinking a bit more and he started getting angrier all the time and he was depressed and he was on antidepressants and things like that. And um, there was one time when he threw a screwdriver at me and it like missed my head by like that much and stuck in the wall next to me and that sort of scared that was like the first time proper scared me one night him and his wife were downstairs arguing about me and Becca and because my bedroom was like right above the living room I could hear everything they were saying and he came in and obviously I was really annoyed at them for arguing about me so when they came in I was just like I had like the little attitude thing going on and I was just like whatever and he's like turn the TV off I was like I'll turn it off and then I turned the TV off and he took the batteries out of the controller and that I was like, what are you doing? I was like, I've turned the TV off, I'm not going to put it back on. And then he just started going to talk mental at me. And then he grabbed me out of my bed and told me to get out. He's like, get out of my effing house and everything like that. And I was like, right, and I'm going. So I started putting my jeans on. But while I was putting my jeans on, like, he totally pushed me. And I was like, what are you doing? I'm going. Like, what else do you want? I was like, you want a big argument? Because that's not what I wanted. I just wanted to go and get out. And then... Um, he kept pushing me and he kept, like, he eventually grabbed me and he sort of threw me and I fell and I was like, by this point I wasn't scared of him anymore, I was just angry all the time at him. I just, I wasn't worried about it, I didn't care about what happened afterwards. So I went up and I started shouting at him and then I slapped him. And then um, after I slapped him, he punched me. And I never expected that. And I never told anyone, I went back. And I obviously thought that it was going to stop after that because, like, you know how people, like, they're always like, oh, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. So I went back and I stayed there again and then things just kept getting worse and worse and worse, so I moved out. Hey, well, I just got out of jail and that, eh, after spending eight months in and that, eh, and eh, I was released, kind of on a tag and that, for the last month, eh, my sentence and that, eh. <coughs> and eh, I breached it, eh, and then I had to go back, eh, to do the rest of the time and that, eh. And I came out eh, and just I became homeless and that, eh? and just basically because I was drinking too much, eh? but now I've like sort of tackled that problem. Eh? I was I, I actually came to Scotland to get away from the amount of, the amount of smack I was doing because obviously back back there um, I had a lot of contacts. I was dealing, uh, doing all sorts of things to fund me a bit. When well I weren't selling, I was at doing the crime, do you know what I mean? And it, and it basically, it was just, it was, it, it was take, taking over my life, do you know what I mean, yeah? And then, obviously, when I got, when I, when I got with that bird, uh, it, it just basically, it just, it all went, it all, all went tits up in, in the space of a month and a half. I lost my car, lost my house, lost my job, basically lost everything, do you know what I mean? Um, that was why I found myself in, in, in this position, do you know what I mean? But, but what, it's, what it's done, by, by me being in here, has made me realise that the next time I get housed, that things have got to be different, do you know what I mean, yeah? Well, it all started when I was at school. Uh, my behaviour was fine until I got further on in the year in high school and my behaviour had just went down. I was taking school, um, I started the drink, so I started drinking every day. And I used to go home and I used to, I used to hit my mum. And then just, everything just all started again. So I moved out when I was 15. And I had moved in uh, with one of my friends. And then I made myself become homeless. It was through my stepdad, me and him had a massive fallout and he didn't really want me in the house. So I had no other choice but to leave. And my other family members don't want me either, so I had to go stay with my boyfriend for a couple of weeks and his friends just dodge about wherever I could find to stay. I'm an alcoholic and 
that led to a breakdown in my my relationship, um, and it led me to lose my my job and my time self joiner. But obviously, I was drinking, and then I started to drink at work, lost my job, um, lost my girlfriend, and I ended up with nothing. I finally got in with my dad. The only problem was it's a two bedroom house and my dad and my brother live there. And then it, for, I lived there for about nearly two years and it just started kicking off like arguments between me and my brother and my dad. My dad had a lot of problems with drugs and things like that and my brother was starting to pick up bad habits as well and I wasn't liking the fact and also, the fact that I had to share a room with my dad didn't help. And then my brother decided to start arguing with me and he went to hit me one day and he hit me, so I phoned the police. And then my dad told me I had to leave the house. Well, I've been homeless twice. This is my second time now in a homeless accommodation. Um, the reason being I'd moved out um, a private let with my boyfriend and... I'd moved back in my mum, he had moved back in with his dad. Mum ended up getting a new boyfriend um, that had been in the jail down in England and he was coming straight out of the jail to come up. And I went and told my sister why he was in the jail. My mum didn't like it because obviously she's trying to get her granddaughter's custody. And I, so I went and told my, my sister something that I should know of, which I think I was only looking at out for my nieces and nephews. And mum had chucked me out. I was um, abused by my husband. Um, and it was physical abuse and, um, and mental abuse and it ended up in sexual abuse. So um, then, then he would start on my three three children, um, hitting them and, you know, and shouting at them. So I just thought I'd had enough. So we ended up moving away. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I got in touch with the family protection unit who then helped me escape um, and then um, told me about uh, Hatley Women's Aid Refuge. Um, I was taken away from everybody who I knew and you're not a, in a Women's Aid Refuge as well, you are not allowed to have any visitors whatsoever for the first few weeks until you get settled in yourself with your children. So you're kind of isolated in a way for a while. Eh? But they are there to, to like speak to you, but it's not the same because you don't have your family and there's nobody could help and everybody says how, well, why didn't family help? You know what I mean? Because they've all got houses and they've all got this. They can't because in this situation, you can't go to your family because the abuser goes to your family. That's the first place to go. So they have to, to hide you. So you're put in homeless situation. Redundancy came, started coming away with the credit crunch. I was one of the people who got through disciplinary procedures because I was over the six month term. They said, I'm not a mean target, it's blah de blah, you know how they go through disciplinary procedures in workplaces uh, just to get rid of folk. So that's how it started off. I had no money. I told my landlord who wouldn't accept housing benefit because it doesn't get paid directly to them, it goes to the person now so they can give to the landlord uh, and then basically what had happened is I got given not a month's notice, I got two days notice to move out which I thought was unreal because I was always up to date with my rent, done everything by the book, I even done up the house a bit as well which I was thought was pretty shoddy because I had done work to the house which I didn't need to do uh, and then basically I was living with my friend for about a week just trying to, because I was phoning up the service, to see if I could get a place, like in a shelter accommodation. They said I could get a bed and breakfast. The thing is, that was in Glen Rothes. We've been on job seekers, well, not even signed on yet, because of this all happening in like the space of a week. Uh, so they told me, there's nothing then we can do. There's nothing closer. So I went to stay with a friend. We fell out and I was on the street for like three days. Do 
junkies had come. Because that's where they used to go for, to get high. <laughs> that's another thing, the needles and everything. It was really scary with the needles as well. In case you were lying on one, if you got stabbed by one. I mean, we, I've lay, laying down on a stone before and thought I'd been jagged and I was straight out of there, eh? That wasn't it, it was just a stone. So you don't want to catch anything, do you? So what was it like today in winter? That was freezing. We were, there was ice, actually. When you go in there, there was ice hanging from the ceiling. That's how, it, I mean, we had... We did have a black, we did have a cover, but you can't take that around for you. <clears throat> but somebody stole it. We had loads of, we had clothes that all got stolen. I mean, that's all we had was our jackets in the winter. And if we'd been out longer, like, in the snow, we would have froze to death. Pretty uncomfortable, especially when you had a sore back in the morning. You just wanted to sleep when you were run, walking around the town and that. Eh? People waking you up, like, what are you doing? Kind of hanging around here. It's like, you dare what to say to them, I'm, I'm homeless and all that, eh? because it's like embarrassing the feeling you get. Eh? Uh, it's no nice, like, especially when you've got the ice at the top uh, winter time. It makes you feel quite bad. It's like, I mean, you know you're dirty yourself, eh? you know people are looking at you, but it's like, you're trying to stay out of the way, yeah, but it's like, oh my God, I'm embarrassed. Eh? There's people that I know from the Y that were sleeping in bins, little bins and stuff, to try and keep warm, eh? because it was snowing, raining. Because we're not actually on the streets, I mean, we're trying to find somewhere we can get shelter, I mean, we're not going to slide in doorways and everything because it's quite embarrassing to be out there, isn't it? Don't want people to see you. I know it'd probably be better if they did because somebody might help you, but you don't want people to see you at your, your lowest. You know the thing that people think is, must be on drugs, you're a junkie. If you're homeless, you're a junkie. If you're homeless, you're stealing out of shops. I mean, you were going into shops to buy something and because you were dirty or you smelled funny, well, you smelled dirty, eh? They'd be like looking at you. the security guards would follow you all around because you're dirty, you're disgusting, you must be a junkie, you're going to steal out my shop. They've even been asked to leave shops. The YMCA was great mm -hmm. for us, but that's only one meal a week. I mean, they can give you like stuff to, to eat, but it's like tin stuff. And so, there's no way to heat it up. I mean, we, we tried to light a fire, the fire was lit. The fire engine comes in, put it out. <laughs> So there's no way to heat it up either. And sometimes if you've not eaten in a while when you go to eat, when you get the chance, it's like you find it hard to eat because you've not been eating in a while. No, uh, it makes you feel sick. Makes you feel sick, you get and Or eat it too quickly and yeah. then you are sick and then you've got none in your stomach again. There needs to be more help. There needs to be more hostels. There needs to be somewhere where you can go and get fed and clean clothes and washed. We just want a stable life. We've done all this, we've seen it all, we don't want to go back to it. We just want to get in a stable house and hopefully one day start a family and everything. But because of all this, all the paperwork and everything, we can't. So what would be the sort of like worst case scenario to happen? We'll be back there. We will be back there. As my relationship with my mother had broken down a long time ago, I knew that asking her for help was not an option. So I stayed at a mate's for a few months. The humiliation I had already suffered at the hands of my ex was bad enough. Now I was homeless, unemployed and depressed. I decided to go to my auntie's and as I had a permanent address I was able to get a job. But as my family suffered a bereavement I took a bit of time off and was sacked. Due to the bereavement within the family it became more difficult for me to stay at my aunt's. So I moved out and was given a place at Valley Gardens Kilcoddy where I stayed for a month or two. Then I was given a homeless flat at Westbridge Halls, Link Living, and as at the time I had a car, I didn't mind being so far away from family and friends. I had started a relationship with a guy and quickly moved in, hoping that I could settle, but this relationship turned sour, so I moved out and in with a friend. This was okay, but it was a small flat, and as my friend had started a new relationship, it soon became overcrowded. I moved back with my uncle, as by this point my options were severely limited, but again he had his own issues. Depressed and manipulating, he got into the habit of using me to take out his frustrations. I began to realise that he was going into my room when I wasn't there and taking things, and I wondered what else he was going through. I felt like a money-making machine, and even when I had paid rent, he would ask for it again. 
Arguing against this was fruitless, as they could always say, no money, no room. After everything, the care, the family and the rejection I had suffered along the way, I decided that enough was enough. I needed to get myself sorted for good, and I called the emergency homeless phone number. I managed to get a place at Gilvan House, and that is where I am now. This is the first time in a long time I have felt like I can get out of the cycle of homelessness and finally get back on the road to a place of my own. It has been good here, and as I'm shown that I can live independently, I'm soon going to be getting a scatter flat, which will lead to my very own tenancy and a home of my own. I am working and have done through most of my journey. I believe I'm working for what you want, but in the hostel it seems you're punished for it. Out of my wages, I have to pay £90 per week to the hostel, which reinforces the viewpoint of many homeless people of what is the point in working. I still need to live, bus fares, and I still have my dog who resides at my mum's. I know that the system at Gilvin has and will be positive for me now and in the future, but there are still things that could be improved upon. It's been a very difficult journey, but at this point I'm confident things can get better. They have to. I just want to go out and meet some people that know, know nothing about me, know nothing about my past, know nothing about where I am now and my situation before. Just go out there and just meet people that I don't have to tell them anything. Just They just know me for me instead of knowing this whole big thing about being homeless and everything like that. I just want people to know me. <laughs> Looking up, what can I say? I have my own house. I'm going back to college. I'll get a wee part time job, and then that's myself. About time, after all this moving about from like hostel to hostel, like flats, getting our hostel, I've eventually got somewhere I can actually call my own, if you know what I mean, like somewhere it is my home, because it's mine. Okay, right. Right. Okay, okay thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.